And welcome one and all to an all new episode of the Comic Multiverse, where the worlds of nerd meet. As always, I'm your host, Joel, and joining me is... Matt! Yay! Hey, Matt, how you doing? How's, uh, how, how's the week been treating you? Pretty chill, actually. I've, I've had a couple of down down days so that's pretty cool that's i thought you meant like literal chill like it's cold where you are or something it's starting to get cold because it's starting to come into winter so it's starting <laughs> to get cold <laughs> which again is always the thing because australia is opposite land you guys have your winter while we have our summer and it i, I wore shorts this week i wore shorts for the first time this week <laughs> Had to had to bust them out and everything and i had just i had just gotten my jeans the way i liked them too <laughs> Speaking of, speaking of Australia, speaking of your proud nation of Australia, it was actually in the news this week. Yeah, yeah, we, we held Johnny Depp and Amber Heard hostage. You sure did. You really did. Now, it's funny. People who will remember from the old uh, Blood Sweat Comics days, we had actually joked about this previously when this news was new, because obviously if anything happens with Canada in the news and if anything happens with Australia in the news, we're all about it. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we joked forever because one of your, like one of your, it wasn't your prime minister, but it was your minister of something like fish and game, was all up in Johnny Depp's ass for bringing his dogs into the country yeah they like smuggled them in because as and we... like didn't declare them or anything right which which you know in all trueness you know yeah that is bad he did break the law he should be you know brought up on that but the dude was totally treating it as like uh as like an opportunity to uh get his name out there in the news and he basically said i will murder johnny depp's dogs if he doesn't <laughs> apologize <laughs> the, the dude whose name escapes me at the moment but he was really freaking aggro and we didn't hear anything about this story for the longest time and then a video surfaced of them it looked like them at like a freaking red roof inn making an isis video <laughs> Yeah, they, they were just off camera, like, the, the guy was, like, holding the dogs hostage, you know, gun to their heads. Like, I'll do it! Apologize! And Johnny Depp looked so angry and so upset, and yet at the same time, like, a kid who got called into the principal's office, where he's like, I guess I gotta do it. <laughs> I guess I gotta say the thing. Now, as we all know, Australia's uh, ecosystem is very fragile, as we learned in the documentary when the Simpsons went to Australia, and they brought bullfrogs in and it destroyed everything. Yep. Yep. Johnny Depp's dogs could very well have overthrown the entire nation of Australia, so, I mean, that minister did what he had to do. Yeah, well, we could be having, like, annual Tim Burton days and whatnot, <laughs> and, you know... Helen and Bonham Carter weekend and whatnot. I would so totally go to all of those if this was five years <laughs> ago. <laughs> I'd happily go to all of those things. Now you know it was either apologize to the Australian people as him and Johnny De or as Johnny Depp and his wife did, or the alternative, which is of course agree to a public booting as is tradition in Australia. <laughs> 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 the Road Warriors and the Immortan Joes would have come out from their Nitro supercars and publicly booted Johnny Depp, but Johnny Depp don't play that shit. <laughs> and see, we can be worldly. We can talk about more than comics and nerd shit, me and Matt. We can talk about world events when we find them hilarious. <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether you saw, but just before we started this, I was watching a Vice video uh, where they had uh your favorite comedian kenny hotz oh that's yeah yeah i had that in uh, another window i went to their channel but i couldn't find it yeah. yeah 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 he was like trolling american politicians like he was going to like trump rallies and nice. rubio uh rallies and all that and he almost got arrested at the marco rubio <laughs> rally as well he like got up on the stage and is like marco rubio isn't gonna win guys he's you know not doing so well and it was funny because like he was saying before the the rally looked like a funeral home because there was only like a couple of people in the crowd. Nice. And then when he started getting all up on the stage, like more people arrived and were trying to beat him up and everything. Oh, I hope Kenny gets another show. Kenny is cool. Yeah, he is. Shit, I should try and get Kenny on this show because I know he's a nerd. I know he's a comic and video game fan. I think he might actually be willing to do one of these. He probably would. Yeah, he's... he's just Gotta, like, talk him up a little bit, kiss his ass a little oh, bit. Oh, absolutely, as I do with all my guests, all the time, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> he he had a show for a little bit, like a radio show, like a serious yeah, radio yeah. podcast. He doesn't do it anymore, but he used to. Yeah, it was really good. I remember watching them on YouTube. It was it was really funny. It was just Kenny, uh, Kenny even more uncut than he usually is. 
and I, I think he even joked in one episode saying, you know, man, I'm so sick and tired of the TV uh, ecosystem as it is right now. Man, I'm just going to go to the internet and make a bunch of money. I'm going to start my own YouTube company. That's where all the money's at. I don't think that happened, but it was his idea. <laughs> Heck, if I could sign with the Kenny Hotz YouTube company, I would. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Uh, uh, yeah, I would. I would. It would be a fun time, if nothing else. Now, uh, before we get to the actual meat of what we have this week, before we get to the news section, I want to start a new uh, thing on the show. I kind of did it at the top of the show last week, and I'm going to start doing this until I can get uh, get some end cards together. But I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to thank and top uh, talk up our newest patrons over on the uh, Cape Jewel Patreon. Uh, we've been up to $44 since last time we talked, in striking distance of our $50 stretch goal, which, if hit, uh, patrons will get uh, the episodes of this show and other videos early before anyone else. So there you go. Awesome. Matt and I were even talking before we started, where it's like, you know, we were talking about uh, doing more commentaries and everything, so we put a commentary uh, stretch goal in there, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe we should, and then Matt pitched the idea, it's only right that the first uh, comic multiverse, Cape Joel Fortress of Solitude commentary should really be the four-hour assembly cut of Batman v Superman, if that ever comes out. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of people are, are looking forward to that. Oh, yeah, it's going to be an event. It's going to be a big four-long-day event <laughs> to get all that done because that's, uh, that's how much content's in there. But, yeah, I just wanted to send uh, some thank yous out there to uh, Black Tija and Crystal Master. Uh, Crystal Master, you'll, of course, know a uh, longtime fan of you and me, Matt, and a bunch of stuff we've been doing for the longest time. He, I assume it's a he. Crystal Master could go either way. It could be a woman Crystal Master. I don't know. Yeah, uh, Crystal Master was like the official, unofficial historian of Blood Sweat Comics and the other uh, comic book cast podcast. You know, it, their knowledge was endless, and they uh, kicked up some money for this show for the comic multiverse. So, thank you to them and to all the other uh, patrons who have given so far. That's uh, that's really taken off good, and because of that, the comic multiverse will have a home. I mentioned this uh, last week. Matt and I are hard at work on that. We've uh, we've seen. What we think the finished project is going to be, Matt's done some art for it, and I think it looks really nice. Obviously, we will keep you up to date on that, and as soon as uh, I, I, as the uh, uh, backlog is uploaded, I'm getting freaking tongue-tied over here. As soon as the backlog is uploaded, and as soon as we get the Patreon money rolling in, I will be sure to uh, keep everyone up to date on that, and I'll have a nice link on the front page so everyone can see it. Cool, cool. Right, so uh, I guess with that, we can hop into our first news story of the week, which is... Uh, there was a rumor surfacing from Bleeding Cool, so obviously take with a massive, massive... Ugh, God, excuse me. Ugh, gassy, I shouldn't drink before I do this show. Uh, massive grain of salt, but that is apparently... Rich Johnson is saying DC Rebirth could be one giant two-year-long mega event with all the books crossing over in one way or another. Oh, God. That sounds a little extravagant, doesn't it? It does, but then again... DC, their events usually last a long time before they mm. reboot them again. So, mm -hmm. yeah, two years of, is about the right time, you know. And, you know, at first I would be like, well, that's crazy. How could you cross over all these, you know, seemingly unrelated books and characters and, you know, ones that never cross over? How could this be one big long event? Then someone pointed out to me, well, when you look at the DC Rebirth titles, it's 90% Batman titles, 90% Superman titles, and some Justice League thrown in there. Yeah, and you're like, oh, yeah, true. And and the funny thing is, like, all the other books, so, like, Suicide Squad and all them, are basically villains for those characters it's as well. It's true. It's true. When you break it down, everyone in this new DC Rebirth universe is much closer and much more interconnected than they ever were before. Most of them are all on the same team or are alternates for teams. Yep. I mean, it's not one of these situations where it's like, hey, this is the first time blank is meeting blank. Mostly everyone knows each other by this point. Mm -hmm. Which, it's an interesting idea, and it totally seems to be the exact opposite of DCU, where it's like, no, you know, we're not, we're not going to have so much continuity anymore. You know, creativity over continuity. This one looks to be continuity over creativity now. <laughs> we're doing the exact opposite. It's only going to be continuity now. More continuity than you can shake a <laughs> stick at. <laughs> we are filling up syringes full of continuity and we're going to shoot you up with it every two months. <laughs> it's 
It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Now, the only thing that kind of takes air out of the sale of this is apparently Dan DiDio. Yeah, I know, right? Dan DiDio took to Facebook, of all things, to denounce this rumor as being silly. <laughs> to which I had no idea Dan DiDio even knew how to work uh, Facebook. I, d I didn't even know he came out. Was, he had like an inter. He had like Jim Lee there with him. He's like, how the fuck do I do this? <laughs> how do I work the Facebook machine? I don't want to play Candy Crush. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to do the message, but he just started playing Farmville. Now, Dan, have you sent that important message shooting down the bleeding cool rumor? I tried, but now I'm making a farm. <laughs> I'm going to start playing the Clash of Clans soon. And now all the books start getting late because everyone in the DC offices is playing Clash of Clans. <laughs> Yeah, they, they all accepted Dan's invites. <laughs> well, geez, he's our boss. We didn't want to say no, right? <laughs> We'd be real dicks if we did that. So, I don't know. This this news seems interesting. I mean, this could just be more Rich Johnson bleeding cool. I, I say the things I want to happen in hopes that they will happen. <laughs> <laughs> he's been listening to us. It's like, hey, these guys have been saying stuff and it's been coming true. Yeah, th they've talked forever that they wanted Superman uh, to come back in Action Comics to be renumbered, and that all happened. <laughs> Yeah, may, let, let me try it. <laughs> yeah, let me try it and see what happens. Like, I know he tried it before when he said, oh, yeah, and Marguerite Bennett is going to be writing Wonder Woman now. Yeah, yeah. Which he, he did, like, a bunch of them. He did, which was a nice thought. I mean, maybe it's the shotgun approach where if you just, you know, fire enough pellets, <laughs> eventually a couple of them are going to have to be right. I call that the El Mayimba effect. Ah, there you go. Or the Babe Ruth effect. People forget that that uh, the great Bambino... Uh, led the league in strikeouts for the longest time too the fact is the fact is no one remembers the strikeouts everyone remembers the home runs <laughs> so the truth the moral of the story is kids don't be afraid to fail multiple times in a row and just make shit up because it'll all be okay in the end <laughs> it's all good uh you know what else uh, will be all good in the end or at least i certainly think it will be uh the defenders and you know why i think that matt why is that uh, because they named the showrunners this week for the Defenders series, and it's going to be the same people who helmed Daredevil Season 2. Oh, automatically be 10 out of 10. Yeah, I mean, they did a great job on that, and clearly that was the most world buildy of all the uh, Netflix seasons, so I mean, I guess it's good that they can follow up on it. Yeah, and we had, I guess, three of the five or six Defenders on in that series, so it shows that they can, like, interconnect teams and everything and get people working together and ample screen time for everyone true true so, true. yeah yeah a lot of a lot of good stuff looking forward to there i mean to think uh we'll be seeing uh civil war very soon and luke cage even sooner yeah coming up yeah you, I, as always i'm sure you will get to see civil war first right See you next Thursday. You lucky son of a... Mm. You know, I actually I actually, I felt like a total dingus. I tricked myself all week into thinking that I'd be able to see the movie at the end of the month because obviously all the critics had gotten to see it and a bunch of people I follow on Twitter were getting to see it in special engagements and I just kind of tricked myself into thinking like, oh yeah, it's coming out at the end of the month, isn't it? Only, <laughs> only when I looked at the actual release dates, oh no, wait, it comes out in Australia and France at the end of the month. I gotta wait till May 6 with all the other North Americans to go see it. <laughs> uh. I was all happy and ready to go like, yep, gonna go see it at the end of the month. Yep, that's me. Only when I looked at showtimes, ah, shit, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could always fly to Australia and go visit Matt just to see the movie. That's only like, what, two-day-long play ride, hundreds <laughs> of dollars just to go see the movie. Yeah. And I'd be coming to Australia during the winter, so that wouldn't mess me up. Oh, don't worry. The days are already hot. Yeah, for real. Yeah, jeez. Hey, you know what? We should do that at some point. You should come visit me. I should come visit you, and we should do, like, the big crossover for the comic multiverse. I'm sure the fans would really appreciate that. And I've never been to Australia. Have you ever been to Canada? No, I've never been out of the country. Oh, shit, for real. I've uh, I've only been out of my country once I went to Florida on vacation. That That actually kind of sucked. <laughs> well, you went to Florida. So. Yeah, well, that was your first problem. You went to Florida. Oh, God, I, I got a terrible ear infection on the plane ride down. My ears wouldn't pop. It was the worst thing. I got, like, a heat stroke pretty much, like, in the first day I was there because, you know, my pasty Canadian body melted in the Floridian sun. <laughs> there was lizards running everywhere. It was totally awful. <laughs> uh, sounds like Australia. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> so you're saying, come to Australia, Joel, if you want to die. <laughs> Man, Joel was in Australia for two minutes and he got bitten by one of those giant spiders, you know, that they have at the airport to greet people. <laughs> Joel angered one of the spiders. Uh, they're our TSA. <laughs> if you can make it past the spiders, you can get into the country. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it something like three of the world's foremost venomous snakes live in Australia or something like that? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fun time, but if you know, if you ever wanted to come to Canada, you know, you could deal with the cold, eh? And ketchup and chips. and the mooses and everything. And the moose, you know, it's like that is a stereotype. But the fact is, if you did come and visit me, I live in the sticks, so you might actually be able to see mooses and all the stereotypical <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying nine out of ten people, you know, who live in my town wear flannel shirts because maybe they are actually lumberjacks. <laughs> he's a lumberjack and he's okay. <laughs> that's that's basically the theme of my small town. Yeah. But hey, we got good Chinese food here. <laughs> Which is kind of a thing in every northern town. I don't know if it's the same in Australia, but every like northern town here, no matter how big or small, has at least one Chinese restaurant. Yeah, I got one up the road from me. Nice. I uh, I watched a great documentary on Netflix the other night on the history of uh, General Tso's chicken. It's called, like, Finding General Tso. It was really entertaining and really interesting. Cool. Yeah, it talked about how, like, uh, Chinese food basically kind of helped to build America and helped, you know, put aside racial tensions during, like, the communist scare in World War II and everything. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a really interesting watch. I say look it out if you're interested in history and especially food history. And uh, more than that, they even answered the question too, where it's like, uh, oh god, it was it's like you know why are there always Chinese restaurants no matter where you go in the world? It's because like in the big port cities like San Francisco and everything, where Asian people come in, they have like actual bureaus uh, to set them up with work and everything. So you. Uh, what is it, you don't hurt another uh, Chinese person's chances of getting employed in the city? It's like, well, you know, go, go to Nebraska if you can cook and open up a restaurant there. There are none. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's really cool and really interesting, too, and kind of harsh, too, at the same time. You figure if you're a stranger in a strange land, you don't speak the language, and they're like, okay, go to Nebraska. There's nothing fun to do there. Yeah, and here's a job, a stable job for you. A stable job in a crappy place. You don't speak the language, you don't know anybody, but you can make the General Tso's chicken real good. <laughs> Another thing I didn't know about General Tso's chicken, did you know it's made of chicken legs? Really? Yeah, it's made of chicken legs. And every restaurant makes it a little bit differently. Oh. More insane than that, the actual creator oh. of uh, General Tso's chicken uh, is still alive to this day, and he lives in Taiwan. Cool. Yeah, he's actually alive, and they showed him, like, oh, here's the American uh, General Tso's chicken. And he's like, oh, that's bullshit. Don't, I don't want to look at that anymore. <laughs> that that pisses me off. I'm like, ah, I like that he's old and cantankerous. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, while we're on the subject of Asia, and we kind of were, can you believe this news, Matt? I'm sure you heard this. They might be making a live-action Pokemon movie soon. I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. Me too. It's like, why is this only happening now in 2016? Why, why didn't this happen in, like, 97 when I was young and would have been totally stoked on this? Yeah, yeah even up to 99, it's like the height of the Pokemon era. Is it? I, I remember, I remember like, the, the Nintendo 64 I got was actual, and I still have the Nintendo 64. Nice. It was a Pokemon limited edition one. Sweet. Is it, is, like, it, is it because the wheel of nostalgia is just turning that way? Have we already done all the Transformers and Gem and the Holograms and G.I. Joes that we could do? Have the 80s been tapped and now we got to move on to the 90s? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I can only assume so. Pokemon directed by Michael Bay. Oh, God. <laughs> Pikachu uses Thunderbolt, blows up everything. Brock is a racist. Yeah, here with visuals by Zack Snyder. <laughs> Ro uh, Brock is just a racist caricature of black people, as in every <laughs> Michael Bay movie. No, do you like what they do with that new Ghost in the Shell movie and like get a white actor and like put Asian prosthetics on him? Yeah, digitally make them Asian. Wow, that that was more news this week. I couldn't believe more. It's like we've got Scarlett Johansson. Well, shouldn't you have cast an Asian actress for that? No, no, no. It's fine. We're going to use computers and technology to make her look more Asian. <laughs> Did, did you hear what the director um, said about that? No, what did he say? I, I kind of I, I tuned he, out. He said uh, he, he couldn't 
cast an Asian actress because there is no good Asian actresses. Ooh, and somewhere <laughs> Lucy, like, and somewhere stop Lu- talking, mate. Stop talking. And somewhere Lucy Liu gets really furious and flips a table. <laughs> And somewhere, um, Ming Na, who plays Agent May on Agents of Shield, she gets really mad too. <laughs> I was gonna say she would have she would have been pretty good for the role as well. She would have, you know, she she's used to like movies like that. I mean, she played Chun Li in that did. Street Fighter movie. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they would say with Ming Na, no, nah, nah, she's too old and everything. Even though hell, she's on Agents of Shield and she's not too old to do any of that cool. She doesn't thing. look. She doesn't look like she's like what 51 or something. She doesn't look it. No, not at all. You would you would be hard pressed to believe that she was the voice of freaking Mulan. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's hard to believe you know i remember too that there was a similar issue that was brought up with this uh during that uh that cloud atlas movie yeah because yeah. they had you know digitally and prosthetically turned a bunch of races you know into other races and you know the excuse they had in that one which i was kind of okay with where they're like you know no 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 the movie is about reincarnation and everything yeah that's the point we're going with and i'm like okay fine that has a built-in reason for it have they said that Ghost in the Shell will have a built-in reason for doing it? No. Well, the thing is, like, uh, I'm a big fan of Ghost in the Shell, and the thing is, the the main character that Scarlett Johansson is playing isn't actually a human; it's a cyborg, right. so it can be basically whatever it wants to be. Right. I'm vaguely so, aware yeah. of Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, I think I watched uh, back back on the independent film channel back when they had that. They would play like real cult anime movies, like late at night. That was one they would play. They'd play Ninja Scroll, which is also awesome. And I remember YTV back in the day when they had an anime block. Back when TV actually played anime before everyone just watched it on the internet. Uh, yeah. They would play uh, the Standalone Complex, which I remember. I would always catch the end of Standalone Complex because I would always be watching something else like South Park or something. But I remember it had a really good ending theme. Yeah, yeah, standalone complex was really good. Now, that being said, just to stroke my own nerd ego, I interviewed Richard Epcar back in the day, who was the voice of Bateau from uh, Ghost in the Shell, so that makes me feel good. Oh, nice. And I'm sure I've told the story, because he is an older gentleman now, Richard Epcar. He's getting up there in age, and when he was sitting there trying to work Skype, I swear to you, and this is one of my finest moments working online, the angrier Richard Epcar got at Skype, the more like Bateau he actually sounded. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. That was amazing. I'm like, oh, so that's how you get into character for Bateau. You just get really pissed off. (laughs) <laughs> you play around with Scott. Yeah, and then the voice just comes out of you. So, uh, yeah, well, geez, Matt, that was good. That was two stories for the price of one. That was Pokemon and that was Ghost in the Shell. Go us. <laughs> uh, now, here's a funny story I thought you and I would get a kick out of. Uh, Marvel is planning to launch an Avengers-themed credit card. Awesome. You know what? I don't have a credit card yet. Uh, maybe that's the one I need. Maybe I need the special Marvel card. <laughs> <laughs> for when I buy their merchandise and go to their movies, I can pay for it with a credit card that has Hulk and Captain America on it. <laughs> now, is it just like um, some credit card company doing like cards that have like pictures of Captain America and whatnot on it? Oh, it's the whole team by the looks of it. Oh, okay. Which leads me to believe, man, did you ever think we would live in a day and age where nerd culture and nerd products are so ubiquitous that you could get it on your credit card? It's pretty cool. It is cool. cool. And to have it be so normalized and everything blows me away. Because obviously, you know, you and I, you know, we're just on the fringe of that generation. We can remember a time when the biggest blockbuster movies weren't all comic book movies, you know, when superheroes were still kind of an underground thing. And to see pop culture and the wider culture just absorb it and embrace it so heavily, it's kind of a weird feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's kind of bizarre in a way it is and it keeps getting more and more bizarre i remember uh like yesterday i went out to the store because i needed ice cream sandwiches as as i often do and i wore my uh black and yellow batman shirt from under armor like a big sports company making a line not just one shirt but a line of superhero shirts which actually cost a fair amount of money this one was gifted to me i was wearing that and a pair of batman flip-flops which i bought from the corner store because they had a bunch of them to tie in with Batman v Superman. They had Superman flip-flops, they had Batman flip-flops, and I'm like, hey, it's summertime, Joel needs some flops because I'm horribly white, as Sean would say (laughs) to me. (laughs) So I needed some flip-flops, and as I'm sitting there in the store in my Batman shirt and my flip-flops, and I'm like, wow, I'm a total freaking nerd right now, and no one's giving me a weird look like at all, 
where there would be a time if you wore that shit, you might get weird looks. It's kind of funny. It is. Uh, like, not an hour ago, I had some of my comics delivered uh, by Courier, and I answered the door, and I'm, I'm currently wearing a um, a Marvel shirt with, like, the Avengers on it. Believe it. And and the, the this woman, she would have been probably, like, 50 years old who answered the door, and she said, hey, that's an awesome shirt. I like Marvel and the Avengers and everything. I'm like, holy shit. And that's and that's why I think Marvel continually wins because they have made it a place for everybody. Literally, everyone gets to join the party, no matter how old you are. Everyone has something to like in them, even if it's just like I like that Tony Stark fella. He drinks like me and says funny things. <laughs> I like that Hulk fella because he smashes stuff. He's he's a, he's a fine fella, that Hulk fella. <laughs> Although honestly, Hulk, geez, Hulk has been around on TV for even longer. So some people are like, I remember when the Hulk was Bill Bixby, <laughs> <laughs> and it was a big green guy. <laughs> he wrestled a bear and threw the bear into space. That was good, wholesome fun. <laughs> this is my old people voice, but yeah. So Marvel credit card, yeah, I'll, I'll get one. Oh uh, yeah, if they do, yeah, I'll like put one in for my my credit card I got at the moment and get it replaced. <laughs> I, I wonder if DC would follow suit in this one and be like, no, 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 we can get you the actual Bat credit card from Schumacher's <laughs> Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Pull it out and have people freak out on you. Uh, <laughs> there's a there's an old meme Bat credit card. Uh, R- remember that Matt in the heady internet days of four years ago? Yeah. Uh, when you'd pull out the bat credit card and people would freak the hell out? Uh, those were the days. Those were the days four years ago. Man, nostalgia is really catching up to itself, isn't it? <laughs> uh, speaking, of, uh, speaking of Batman and nostalgia and having to wait, uh, The Dark Knight Returns 3 Master Race. We haven't seen a new issue in a while, have we, Matt? No, I wonder why. And we're not going to see a new issue for a while. They, even though they solicited uh, the newest issue, they've taken it off the solicitations now. Solicitations now, and we we don't know when the new issue is coming out. It's gone from it's coming out in June to just we don't know when it's coming out. It'll come out when it's done. God damn it! <laughs> so we're already on Duke Nukem time now, basically. And it's gone to that point where, like, um, as you you were saying as well, like people are just like, eh to it now like they they remember it and they're like oh yeah that that series eh. you had the hype you had people by the short and curlies you had people excited everyone was taking note everyone was paying attention but you couldn't keep the book on a schedule <laughs> <laughs> for real guys you just couldn't keep and you know i probably heard it too it's like you know well we could do this or we could devote all our time to dc rebirth and all the other books I think that's what's happening. I'm sure that's exactly what happened. And it's sad to see that happen, but it's like, it's in this situation, like, sometimes you gotta cut off a finger to save the hand, and this was the finger. Yeah, isn't that ironic? Because, like, the, the series Frank Miller did before this, wasn't it uh, the Batman and Robin Boy Wonder? All-Star Batman and Robin. Yeah, that one didn't get finished. Mm. I'm wondering if this one will get finished. Christ, I hope this one gets finished. That would just be such a sad like thud for it to not get finished. I think the problem with All-Star Batman and Robin is it was chronically late and it was also terrible on top of it, so they didn't yeah. want to finish it. I think this one is getting well enough reviewed that they're going to want to finish it, even if they can just sell trades when it's all done. Yeah, well, yeah. isn't there like every time an issue is released, don't they release that issue in hardcover as well? Do they really? I didn't hear it. I would not yeah, be surprised. Because I, I heard that like um, you get... Like, when the issue comes out, you get the normal issue, and then, I think, like, a week later or a couple of weeks later, they release the same issue, but in hardcover, and it comes with, like, backstory, uh, all the variant covers and everything, and they, they apparently all go in this, like, slip case that you can buy as well. That sounds, I remember seeing that. That sounds so, yeah. extravagant, but I don't doubt it. Well, it's, you know, milking that Batman money. you got to milk it for everything that's worth. That's why each comic has, like, 20 variants. 20 variants. Well, it is funny when they were first talking about Dark Knight Returns. They're like, you know, this this is the book to get us out of our slump because it was like the only book that was cracking the top five for DC like a couple months ago when they were yeah. really hurting and none of their books were in the top five, which was like for the first time in forever. Yeah, yeah, and th- I think that's kind of like what pushed them for Rebirth as well. Yeah, and you know, I, I wonder too, it's like, when this book finally does finish up, how many people are going to keep up with it? They're like, well, I could buy the next issue of Dark Knight Returns, or I could buy these monthly DC Rebirth titles now, which they're asking me to buy. <laughs> yeah. 
for cheaper as well. For cheaper, yeah. That, that might hurt them. That might hurt them in the long run. I mean, I hope they finish it up because I was, for the most part, digging the story and I'd like to see where it goes. Remember, too, there were supposed to be tie-ins to Dark Knight Returns 3 that were yeah. going to be written by Miller on his own. They're not talking about those anymore. Yeah, there was going to be like that Joker one that was advertised in the back of every comic last month. Yeah, it was going to be this deal where it's like, okay, here's here's like the last days of Batman as a crime fighter. Here's like him on his last job, and here's Poison Ivy and Catwoman and everything, and then nothing. Yeah, none of that happened. None of that happened. Fr Frank Miller has like a poor history of being involved in projects that just don't get finished. Heck, even even Jim Lee was making fun of that at the DC Rebirth yeah. panel, where it's like, oh, so it's All Star Batman. It's kind of like my series, All Star Batman and Robin, that I'm gonna finish one day. <laughs> yeah, but also like he's got um, Brian Ozzarello, like I guess writing for him or ghost writing for him. So like whatever it is, now. I don't know what the deal is with that. Yeah, what's like, what's keeping them? Yeah, it, it's got to be Rebirth. It's it has be. to be. It has to be. I can only assume Rebirth uh, threw a wrench into everything. Can yeah. only assume. Uh, and yeah, I guess that'll do it for the news this week. Uh, it was an interesting grab bag of topics and whatnot. We hope you all enjoyed it. And from there, we can transition on over to what we read this week. And uh, I had a fairly big week. How about you, Matt? I did as well. I've still got three comics to review. My week was a lot of catch-up is the thing because I had a bunch of shit left over because I've been taken on. More events now than I ever thought I did. We're smack dab in event season currently. Also, there was a bunch of new number ones where I might have just did the did the first one. Then maybe maybe I won't come back. Maybe I will. Plus, you know the same old TV stuff and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to go first or should I? Uh, you can. I went first last week. Okay, so uh, one comic I didn't think I'd get you this week, but everyone was asking for it, and even though they were asking for it, it's not doing great numbers right now, so I guess not as many people liked it as I <laughs> thought they did. That would be the unbelievable Gwenpool issue number one. And how was that? It's actually, it was actually pretty good. It was pretty decent. Yeah? It's pretty, I mean, like, it's funny is the thing, but it's also, like, it's a book that knows it's a joke and leans on the fact that it's completely absurd. Yeah. And yet it's kind of fascinating because I also put up my review of Deadpool number nine from last week. And it's funny, that book is so much more grounded now and so much less crazy. It's almost like Gwenpool has adopted all the ticks that Deadpool doesn't have anymore. Like she has all the text gags and everything and all the meta self-awareness that Deadpool hasn't exhibited in a bit. Yeah, cool. Yeah, well, here's the funny thing, because obviously I was a little confused because I hadn't been reading the Howard the Duck backups. Gwenpool is not an alternate world version of Gwen Stacy like I thought she was. Oh, really? No, she's not. Her name is Gwen first name, Pool last name. That's P-O-L-L-E. And she is from our world. Okay. Like the world you and I live in. She is a gigantic Marvel Comics fan who somehow found her way into the comics. We don't know what... They haven't told us her origin yet, to which she even jokes about, where it's like, who does origin stories anymore? I'm not going to bog down my first issue in an origin story. <laughs> huh, that's pretty cool. It is, and here's the thing. She has no superpowers. She has no healing factor. You know what her power is? What? Tropes and knowledge. Because she's a comic reader, she knows what's going to happen, and the only reason she chose to become a superhero is because, as she says it, nothing bad happens to the good guys in comics. That's true. That I'm like, wow, that's actually quite clever. But then I actually thought about it. I'm like, well, talk to Frank Castle and Daredevil about that. And talk to Cyclops about that. I think a better thing to say is, bad stuff doesn't happen to the heroes for very long. Yeah, 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 that's true. But yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting premise. And like they kind of pull the rug out from under her in the end. It's an interesting book. It's an entertaining book. My thing is, I don't know if it will stay interesting and entertaining. Because unlike Spider-Gwen, which gave you a whole new universe full of new characters, this is just kind of one off-the-wall character living in the world as we know it. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. It, you know, at least they've had a new angle on it. You know, at least they're coming at yeah. it a different way. Uh, I I do like that the subtitle is the unbelievable Gwenpool, and I'm like, yeah, that's a good subtitle. Unbelievable is right. <laughs> <laughs> And you know eventually they're going to have to build up to it, Gwenpool eventually meeting Deadpool and what that's going to be like. Oh, yeah, totally. I like his Deadpool has some money now and runs a corporation. Wouldn't it be funny if he sued her? I'm suing you for copyright infringement. <laughs> That'd be great. This is a flagrant ripoff of my character. 
in every way. You've even stolen some of my jokes, and I want them back. <laughs> and Matt Murdock could be his lawyer, and there you go. Yeah, there you go. It was perfect. There, I, I, I just wrote a new event right there. Yeah. Pool League is what you could call it. <laughs> pool League. Pool League. It'll be great. It'll be great. We'll do it this year. I'll pool versus pool. Pool versus pool. Pool v. Pool. Dawn of yeah, Dead. Yeah. There we go. There we go. There you go. There's your series. That, that, that one's free, Marvel. That one's free. The next one's going to cost you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you have this week, Matt? Uh, I had All New, All Different Avengers issue 8. I also read this. This is kind of like the end of that side of the standoff event. Yeah, it's. I think there's only like three issues left, two, three issues left of this event, including the last standoff issue. Right. Um, but this one was pretty cool. I it didn't was. expect Wade Wilson to be the one to stop this whole Pleasant Hill event. Yeah, Deadpool ends up being the big hero who quashes the super villain breakout. And it's funny, too, because he did it in a book that's not the book that he is currently in. Yeah. It was Mark Wade who chose him to be the hero, which is funny. Yeah, I, I thought it was great because he, he didn't use, like, uh, quips or anything. He just like sat down with his Kobik and just sort of explained to her that he's been under control of someone before as well, and he knows what it's like. And mm-hmm. you need to take control of your own powers and everything. Yep. It was pretty cool. It's it's funny too because you think and like Wade does a great fake out where you think Miles Morales and Kamala Khan are going to be the ones to do that because you know they're all young, so they'll they'll have a talk with Kobik. You know they'll they'll get to her on her level, and then they get hit by shrapnel, and Deadpool's like, "No worry, I got this." <laughs> yeah, he's like, "How would have fight the big armadillo monster?" Yeah, that was that was fun stuff. That was good stuff, and. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it, it ends with C- Captain America, who's young again, with Bucky and Sam basically doing Avengers Assemble, let's settle this problem now. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And I know, like, I think the I think just before this issue came out, like, one of the free comic book days leaked or something that had the next issue in it. Oh, So dude. we got to see, see the Wasp, the new Wasp and everything. Oh, cool, cool. Looks pretty cool. The the issue is, I'm not doing going to spoil it for you, but the issue is really cool, especially like the ending and what you find out what the the wasp is doing throughout the whole issue. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, another thing I liked about this issue is we finally figured out the mystery of the two Maria Hills that have been running around, and it turns out neither of them were the real Maria Hill, actually. Yeah, they were Captain America and Spider Man villains. Yeah, nice, nice touch. It's like which is the real one? Neither. So I mean. I guess from that we're to believe the only real Maria Hill was the one who was hanging out with Captain America all this time. I guess so, yeah. There you go. Problem solved. But then again, <laughs> you have to wonder, it's like, okay, but was this still Maria Hill's plan to uh, abuse the human rights of all these villains, or will there be yet another twist on top of this? Yeah, I don't know, because one of the fake Maria Hill says the real Maria Hill is corrupted. Mm. And... And doing evil stuff, so yeah, I, I don't know. Interesting, interesting. That's the thing, what I like about this standoff event. Every time you think you got it pegged, every time you think you got it figured out, they pull the rug out from under you and there's a whole other layer on top of it. Yeah, and it's been great. Like, each issue I've gotten, I've been saying like how well they're tying in each issue together. They're tying in really well, but more than that, they're also telling their own individual story while being tie-ins. Yeah, so I, I hope that sort of thing carries over into civil war too as well Me all too. the times that happen in there aren't just times for the sake of having the civil war emblem on the front cover absolutely me too because that's one of the things where it's like i'm obviously going to want to check out all the civil war books just like i checked out all the standoff books and i liked almost all of the standoff books yeah they were all pretty much great they were uh i guess from one civil war time to another because i know you read this uh, i also read illuminati number six uh this week yep now, that was pretty thing. cool. I haven't been keeping up with Illuminati, but it was pretty cool. That's, that's the beautiful thing. Even if you haven't read a single word of Illuminati, you can still jump into this one and know exactly what's going on. Yeah, I, I figured out exactly what was going on thanks and, to this issue. And on top of it, if you have been reading Illuminati like me, it's doubly rewarding because this acts as both a tie-in and as the perfect cap-off to the arc because, of course, if you've been reading Illuminati, you know, uh, Titania... Uh, one of the Hood's uh, new Illuminati members has wanted to get back her husband, Crusher Creole, the Absorbing Man, from jail. And that's the only reason she signed up with the Illuminati and the Hood. And uh, she was about ready to walk out in issue five when he says, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to go break out your husband. Only, of course, as we know from reading standoff, Absorbing Man is in Pleasant Hill and that's where they'd have to go. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that is when he was in Pleasant Hill, he was sort of 
trying to get into a relationship with the sheriff who turns out to be Elektra. Yes, which is a huge bombshell because it's like, wait, 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 that means S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't just keeping uh, super yeah. villains in the jail. They were keeping morally questionable heroes there, too. That makes me wonder, geez, are we going to run into the Punisher next? <laughs> Yeah, they, they even made, like, a, a point of saying that, like, who did, who in S.H.I.E.L.D. did Elektra piss off to get sent here? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Opens up a whole whole new thing of it, too. And really, it makes Crushel Creole the main character and actually makes him kind of sad and kind of sympathetic, this idea where he's like, you know what, I liked being an ice cream man in Pleasant Hill. I was happy. I had friends. I had a business. I, I now see what my wife was talking about, trying to live the simple life and everything. And he tells that to his wife, and his wife is just uber pissed at him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I said that in my review as well. Like, you, you kind of feel for all, all these villains because they, mm. they, all through the books, they've been saying like, "This ain't right. What Shield has done to us. This is goes against everything." Like, we're villains, yeah, but like, we don't do stuff like this. We were we were abused. We were really abused yeah. in a really meaningful way, and they kind of turn it on its head even more so at the end. It reminded me a lot of, uh, and I mentioned this in my own review of, like, in DC when Luthor started up the secret society of supervillains when uh, Martian Manhunter and all of them were going around uh, erasing villains' memories and changing their personalities. And Luthor was like, you know, we gotta start our own group to protect ourselves from superhero aggression. Uh, Crusher Creel basically says that to the hood in this book, saying we need to do that, and that's what the Illuminati needs to be. Yeah. Which is really scary to see, you know, him go even more evil and be like, you know, there's going to be a whole new pa- uh, batch of villains out there who are going to be disillusioned with S.H.I.E.L.D. and angry at the Avengers, and when they do, we should be there to recruit them. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's been pretty great, and I, I said in my review that, like, all these different teams now are getting, like, pissed at one another and mm-hmm. S.H.I.E.L.D. and everything, so it's going to be interesting to see, like, the culmination of that, I guess, in the last issue of Standoff, yeah. maybe, and see, like just this massive battle between all these different teams who are fighting each other but also fighting S.H.I.E.L.D. It's also interesting, too, how they're kind of, like, drawing the battle lines, assumedly for Civil War, and you know this event is going to have, like, some crossover with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um... Uh, another book from this week that I'm sure we both read was Batman Superman number 31, the continuation of the Super League event. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, Batman uh, or Superman going down to Gotham to uh, break the news that he's dying to Batman. Yeah, and Batman's reaction to it was great as well. Perfect. Literally perfect is the way I would put it. Yeah, he's like trying to figure out all these reasons why he can help Superman, but Superman's like, nope, Kryptonian tech said I'm dead. The the bit I love is that Batman puts on a tough face in front of Superman and B's like, you know, ah, you'll be fine. Ah, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We always figure it out. And then the su- second Superman leaves, Batman smashes his own computer because yeah. he's angry. You're like, aw, he cares, but he can't show it in front of him. Aw. Yeah, I like the scene before that where Alfred comes down and, like, thanks Superman for his service and everything. And that, I think, was the little thing that sort of set Bruce off as well. Like, he's like, oh, shit, this is real. Also, too, you know, hey they thank superman for their service but would they thank you for your service batman if you were to die (laughs) i think in his heart of hearts he knows the answer and the answer is no no being batman that's why he's bit bit, that's why he smashed the computer i want thanks too (laughs) being being batman is a thankless job and that's the tragedy of it isn't it yeah superman gets statues and parades what does batman get nothing a floodlight on top of the GCPD. But it's a pretty pimpin' floodlight, though. <laughs> uh, the other interesting thing about this issue is that it kind of plucks Supergirl out from the continuity limbo that she's been in since her own series ended and kind of makes her a focal point in this now. Yeah, I, d- I don't know why she's... she obviously captured by someone. I suspected it might be the DEO. Mm, that'd be interesting. Um, you know, because, you know, that's in her Rebirth series and they got to tie that in and everything. Gotta, gotta plant um, the seeds. Yeah, but, um, like, why is she in her costume and under red sunlight? She, she doesn't have her, her powers. powers. And was yeah. working as a barista and everything. Well, I guess we're gonna have to read Action Comics this week to find out. <laughs> uh, also, another cool thing is, we got more about that Superman. Yes. That, uh, mysterious one and apparently he's that the the guy who was escaping last issue and he can turn into superman or it turns into when there's someone some life-threatening danger nearby yeah very interesting so, so the guy's like an asshole and he pushes a kid off a roof just so he can and power then, up 
Yeah, just so he can power up and become Superman. And I thought that's a really unique dynamic because the secret identity of this guy is like a criminal, mm. whereas like the alter ego superhero is a good guy. It's it's also a nice dichotomy. I can only be a hero when people need me. I can't abuse my powers for personal gain. Yeah, yeah. Also, the, this this Superman looks like Superman as well when he yeah. changes. Yeah, he does. So, no idea who it is though. Yeah, for real. Yeah, very very, very interesting event. Uh, I like too. It's coming out at a good rate too. How we basically had an issue every week for this event. Yeah, well, it kind of has to. Yeah. to... Yeah, to, to meet the deadline uh, for Rebirth. Up, yeah, wrap up Rebirth and everything. Wrap it up, wrap it up. Uh, speaking of Superman, uh, this will probably be up by the time this show goes up, but I did a new Cape Kitchen this week. I made Kryptonite Punch. Oh, nice. It's one of the nicer dishes I've made, and uh, I served it in a nice Superman tumbler glass, and I had, you know, like those superhero ice cube trays you can get? They're little Superman yeah. shields that I filled with uh, red fruit punch. Oh, cool. Is, is the punch just like booze <laughs> well it's just, just, just straight straight like whiskey it's it's <laughs> it's a little green uh jolly rancher like kool-aid mix uh some mountain dew but you could really use anything uh limes because hey they're green and then you know all topped up and mixed together i say in the video if you want to serve it with some booze that's called a dirty kryptonite and if you want to serve it to someone you hate add laxatives that's a brown kryptonite <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The booze one is the synthetic kryptonite, yeah. <laughs> and, and and the clean one is just like normal kryptonite. And then you like can do like the red and the yellow and everything. And it's a different shot for a different color is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you add it and make it different and make it good. It actually turned out tasting pretty nice is the thing. Uh, I think I may have added too much of the flavor packet, so it was like really like hits you in the face sweet. And then the sourness of the limes come in, and they're like, okay, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, and of course I use these videos as a chance to do like little histories of kryptonite and everything. Is there a brown kryptonite? Because I think that could go really far in the comics. A brown kryptonite that just makes super characters shit their pants every time you pull it out. Well, well, if you want the answer to that, you might have to go check out my Types of Kryptonite Ooh. video I did about a month ago. I will go check that out. Pluggy, pluggy. Yeah. I was surprised Smallville invented quite a few uh, things of kryptonite. Yeah, yeah, they invented quite a few. Like, I think they invented, like, black and silver kryptonite. and They did. Yeah, all that. A new use for red kryptonite was another thing. Yeah, I was like, glad they didn't bring in pink kryptonite. <laughs> was that, is, is, is that the one that makes Superman fancy? Makes him gay. <laughs> I knew I'm yeah. not making that up. I'm not making that up. It turns... Kryptonian's homosexual. Wow, what, but it, it doesn't technically exist because it appeared in one panel in the super, in the Supergirl annual book. <laughs> Way to go, comic writer! <laughs> <laughs> creating, creating your stuff. Come on, man. Come on. Uh, what else did you have this week, Matt? Uh, I had Green Lantern: Edge of Oblivion issue four. Mm. Pretty cool. I don't know whether you saw the cover for this, but it's basically. Uh, Guy Gardner saying motherfucker. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it, no, he, like, he says that on the cover. The cover is him, and he's, like, in, like, this, uh, he's got, like, his mouth gagged and everything, and, and the word he's saying is, like, muffled, but it, it, it's clearly meant to say motherfucker. <laughs> I'm tired of these motherfucking lanterns in this motherfucking space. It, this was, this gave me a twist, and I did not see this twist coming. Apparently, the bad guy of this book is actually the good guy. Oh. Yeah, Maradell is the good guy, and the two uh, Guardian people, Osras and Dismas, that have been sort of running the planet and met with the Green Lanterns and everything, are the bad guys. And they turn the planet against Maranel. Oh, jeez, evil Guardians. We haven't seen that one before. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, the way Maranel explained these guys is they're the blackest knights. Ooh. So I'm, I'm wondering if that was just like a... A, a turn of phrase or something or whether they are related to like necron and the blackest night and everything interesting yeah because they 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 do look pretty evil and everything <laughs> and they they eat aliens to like heal themselves wow what jerks yeah pretty cool but like their powers also entail them like clouding the minds of people which mm. is how they were able to take over the planet and they've also taken over all the green lanterns mm. the killer wog and like three others and that includes Guy Gardner, who sort of goes against everyone in this issue and ends up getting his ring taken off of him again. And Oops. Yeah. 
it looks it's looks looking pretty cool and this is all happening three days before the universe explodes as well <laughs> so yeah universe always exploding i guess i guess the other book i read this week was the new number one i don't know if you got a chance to read it either but moon knight moon knight number one i flicked through it and also the comics i got this week gave me an actual poster for it as well oh wicked yeah it's it's a cool image it's a really cool number one image i like it yeah the the, the comic itself looks pretty cool as well oh, it's, it's a beautiful looking comic it's funny it's it's lemire doing the writing and the art reminded me very much of sorrentino who he of course worked with on old man logan and green air it's not him but uh, yep. even still, it's very, it's very trippy, it's very psychedelic, which fits with the story, because the story itself is very, very Shutter Island. Yeah, uh, Mark is trapped in a mental asylum, and apparently he was never Moon Knight, or he thought he was, but he wasn't. <laughs> He's trapped in an insane asylum, which may be real, maybe not. The doctors are telling him that Moon Knight was never real, that it was just a coping mechanism his sick mind came up with. Yeah, so is this a continuation of that last Moon Knight series? Maybe? I don't know, because if you were... Because I never read that, and I wasn't too sure about this series. I I don't think you really need it, is the thing, because all of those other Moon Knight stories, uh, like from the Ellis run to uh, everyone who picked up the book after, because basically what it was is that Ellis did his six issues, then Brian Wood did six issues, then ironically Lemire did six issues, then Bun did six issues, and they were mostly one-and-done self-contained stories. Uh, oh, okay. So no, I don't think you needed to read the previous run. They were good runs. They were good stories if you wanted to. But no, this seems to be starting fresh. And in fact, in many ways, they seem to be thinking that you don't know who Moon Knight is, or you have at least a passing knowledge because they talk about all his other split personalities in this issue for a minute. Cool. The taxi driver, the millionaire, and everything. And it's again, it's a very mind-bending kind of comic where they're like, "Ooh, question reality. Is this real? Is anything real?" Nice. Or or is he just like a nut job hearing voices? I do like it. There's a bit, and again, if you flip through the comic, I'm sure you see it, where he creates a makeshift Moon Knight costume out of like bed sheets and pillowcases yeah. and everything. Yeah, it's the, it's the one on the cover, isn't it? Yep, minus the straight jacket. And I'm like, yeah, it's not a bad look, actually. Yeah, but the thing is, it looks like he has a pair of underpants on his head. <laughs> you made it work, man. I, I know some people were saying, man, I was kind of worried about that cover because it looked like a Klansman on the cover. And I'm like, yeah, I guess a little bit. <laughs> now there's a radical direction for Moon Knight. <laughs> Just... In a past life, Mark Spector was a, was a Klansman. <laughs> Mark... He was a Grand Dragon. <laughs> Mark, Mark Spector was a uh, William Bedford Forrest. He was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh man, wouldn't wouldn't that be a funny issue? Uh, Moon Knight goes to Harlem, you know, to chat it up with Luke Cage and everything. Luke Cage is like, "What the fuck are you wearing, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't wear that in public, man. Yeah, you can't you can't wear that here, and you especially can't wear that around me." And Moon Knight's like, "What? It's my costume." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that one was interesting. Uh, I liked that one. I wonder if it's gonna remain. Uh, all mind bendy, or if they're gonna like actually start telling a further story with it, but uh, but it's interesting. I liked it. Cool. I'm I'm probably gonna review it later on. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fun one. Cool. Uh, what did I have? I had Agents of Shield issue four. That was another standoff time. Uh, I read it too and decided not to review it because it has absolutely zero tying in anymore. Yeah, yeah. I kind of said this in my review. I'm like, this is just a retelling of the last New Avengers issue. Uh, in a little, like, and you know what? And like the new Avengers issue, I could kind of buy because they still had Rick Jones with them as the whistleblower, and Rick Jones is still important. They have nothing left important to do over there. No, yeah, it was yeah, a retelling of that fight between the Agents of Shield oh, and yeah, the new Avengers. Oh yeah, from their point of view, where we learn no new yeah. information. Yeah, and then like at the end, we find um, uh, May and all that on AIM Island stealing the Axiom protocols, which I didn't actually. I kind of forgot what they were. Like, I remember they were like Coulson's plans to defeat like villains and superheroes and everything. It was his but tower kinda, of Babel. Yeah, I kind of forgot about it, and w- I said to my was review, that like, AIM oh, maybe that be... they were on. Yeah, it was former AIM Island. Oh, right. Because AIM Island's moved to like some new locations now called Avengers Island. Right, of course, of course. I thought it was a real missed opportunity too for that book because you know when Garrett was attacking the new Avengers at the end of that issue, I thought wouldn't it be cool if Coulson and his people got roped into that and you would see it from their point of view? But no, that's not what happened. This was just the next issue of Agents of Shield. Was all it was. Yeah, well, I kind of expected like the agents, like Deathlock and Gemma and all that, to actually follow after. 
the new Avengers and like arrive at their island as like Shield was attacking as well. Yeah, as the American kaiju was messing stuff up, but no. Yeah, but um, we finally learned out who that Logan character was, of and it was Coulson. Course, of course, it was. Did, was there ever any doubt that it was? Well, I remember, I remember saying like, "Well, maybe it's Ward," but I think Ward was the guy in the Silver Century and Iron Man armor at yeah, the end. The Iron Thief, as they're calling him, and then that was the yeah. next. Instead of to be continued, it was like next issue Ward, and I'm like, okay, I won't be reading it. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong; it's a fine book shield, but not fine enough to review every week. Yeah, that's fair enough. Like, it's just good enough. I thought it was fine, although I did feel a little cheated reading it, where I'm like, this this isn't much of a tie-in. I will say this, if you've been reading all the tie-ins, this is one you can most definitely skip. Yeah, uh, I'll probably check out the next issue just to see how they introduce Ward into the comics. That'd like, be interesting. W- like, what he is, right. exactly. But yeah, I probably won't review it. Yeah, just, just for your own curiosity, just to flip through it a little bit. Yeah. Jesus, uh, but what else did I have going on, man? I, I had so much this week that I'm I'm forgetting, and because I'm catching up, I can't tell old from new. Uh, oh, I had uh, all new X Men issue number eight this week. Uh, Who? Beast teamed up with uh, Doctor Strange to waste a bunch of time until their Apocalypse War crossover next issue. <laughs> L- literally, Beast just goes to Doctor Strange and says, "Okay, I I I finally realized I hate the present now." I hate 2016. Can you can you give me magic mumbo jumbo to get me and my friends back in time? I've decided I hate it here now. <laughs> and Doctor Strange is like, no, no, fuck off. <laughs> and they have an adventure, and it's it's it really did feel like wasting time. Yeah, so it was like a filler episode on a TV show. It was a total filler episode, and not only was it a filler episode, but it jumped so radically from where the last issue left off to this one, and it's all Beast is the thing. You know, you pick up a book, all new X-Men, you don't see any of the other X-Men. It's just Beast and Doctor Strange. Oh, really? <laughs> yep, really. Which, don't, which hey, Beast is my favorite X-Men, usually, and I like Doctor Strange, but for some reason this was just a combo that did not work together. Yeah. And, you know, and like, yeah. I could see where the germ of the idea came from, where it's like, okay, one's a man of science, one used to be a man of science, but is now a man of magic, and now they're forced to work together. Yeah. But it was just such a foregone conclusion, because, like, well, you know they're not going to go back. They have a whole series they have to uphold. <laughs> so I know this isn't going anywhere, so I'm just going to watch, you know, twiddle your thumbs for a little bit until you eventually decide, okay, I'll stay in the present then. And that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's literally literally all that happened uh another book i didn't finish i promise i will have a review up for it when i'm done it's just really long uh wonder woman earth one i got to like the halfway point in it i heard people say this was kind of crap really see i've, I've been enjoying it so far again mm-hmm. i'm only at the halfway point i mean it could crap its pants at the end for all i know uh, what i did find interesting about it is grant morrison finally writes like an actual believable uh, reason as to why the Amazons would have an invisible jet. Yeah? Yeah, and that is that, well, you see, their island continued in time, so they became a super advanced society with healing rays and, you know, lasers and flying vehicles of their own modeled after Hermes and everything. And uh, that jet belonged to one of their greatest champions who had installed, like, a cloaking device and everything in it. Oh, cool. Well, what was the actual reason she had an invisible jet? They never gave. They never gave an ad. <laughs> they never gave an ad. And every production movie, values, you know, they couldn't draw the jet, so they just draw Wonder Woman sitting in the sky. And it's even stupider because it's like, if Wonder Woman can fly, why does she need a flying? Jet? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, and you know, it's like every new cartoon and every new comic and everything tried to give a different reason for Wonder Woman's flying invisible jet, and most of the time they just throw up their hands like she has it. Yeah. Oh, uh, so like, was it? Better than you remember, like we talked about those pages that got released like mm. a while back. I haven't got to any of the really controversial stuff yet. Oh, really? I ha- yeah, I'm halfway point, and I haven't gotten any of the really controversial stuff yet. I guess they must have backloaded it. Uh, one one thing that is kind of funny is that uh, Wonder Woman totally has a girlfriend on the uh, uh, Themyscira. She totally has like a lover, and the lover is the great champion. Uh, with the <laughs> invisible jet and everything, and she she beats her in combat when she's not supposed to against her mother's wishes, so she can take the jet, so she can bring Steve Trevor home. And her lover, whose name is Maul, is just like, "Yo, uh, honey, what's what, what's going on? Why, why why did you kick my ass and take my jet? What is is it something I did?" <laughs> 
And I'm like, oh, I like that's their spat they're having. That's nice. Also, uh, Grant Morrison, total continuity nerd that he is, works in a ton of different Amazons from like across Wonder Woman lore. So Troya is there, and Artemis is there, and every uh, Amazon whose name you know is there in the background. Oh, nice. Is is um Black Steve Trevor better than White Steve Trevor? Uh, well, here, here's the funny thing about Black Steve Trevor, and again, I'm at the halfway point. Amazons have their own language. And so she can't understand him, he can't understand her, and they basically got to speak phonetically at each other. Uh huh. I would say at this point, Black Steve Trevor is as about as bland as White Steve Trevor was. <laughs> do you think that's something they're going to do in the movie where Amazon speak like ancient Greek or something? Yeah, you know, it would be kind of interesting. I mean, f- for like story reasons, I always liked the idea that like in Marvel, the Asgards, yeah, we're just speaking English. Whatever, man. We don't we don't need it. Let's move on. <laughs> I mean, there could be a funny scene of them trying to understand each other. I mean, if if it grows the movie, I mean, I guess in a way it always did kind of bug me. Where it's like, yeah, why don't they speak ancient Greek? Why why do they speak English? Yeah, because I would have thought like them being like kind of secluded on an island or like like um Queen Hippolyta. I thought like maybe because she's like an envoy to like a uh, mm. uh, lot of countries, like she could speak English, but like everyone else doesn't. That's they don't true. Go go anywhere else. And they and they do make a point of saying in this that you know even though Hippolyta has cut off the Amazons from everyone else, she still keeps an eye on man's world. She still has like a magic mirror where she watches everything that's going on, and they like show her seeing nine eleven and the invasion of the Middle East and oh, everything. Wow. And it's like oh, she wow. does this every couple centuries just to remind herself how shitty man's world is, and been like, yep, made the right choice. <laughs> Yeah. The the one thing I don't get with these Earth One titles is that, like they're all in like Batman and the Superman, the Teen Titans and all that. Mm. They're all in the same universe, but they never reference each other. Not yet, they haven't. But I imagine which we'll, is really weird. You it's, know, down the line, we'll eventually get like Justice League Earth One. That'd be interesting. I'm sure that's what they're eventually building up to because they've already announced Flash Earth One and Aquaman Earth One. Oh, we'll get them in, like, ten years' time. Yeah, uh, you know, we'll probably get them just in time for their own movies is what we'll get. <laughs> because we, because we'll need a new book out there that people can jump into. Uh, again, only halfway into the Wonder Woman book could crap its pants. One thing I do like, and it's such a Grant Morrison idea that he put in here. You know how, like, in ancient Greek plays and everything, all the famous ones... Uh, if you ever saw it, they would always have, like, the gods up above or everything. They would always have, like, the fates who were mm-hmm. characters in the play and also narrators. Yep. He does that in this book, too. Oh, nice. So the fates are actually watching events and everything, and they're speaking in that very overly dramatic play voice where it's like, oh, and, and the queen's daughter doth make a choice. You know, will it? Uh, w- will this spell doom for her and her people? Let us watch and see. <laughs> that's it's, awesome it's an interesting choice and it's a very grant morrison type thing to do uh it's funny i've been reading it i'm at the halfway point now and there's no villain is the funny thing there's really no villain <laughs> yeah so it's just like set up of wonder woman i, I, I mean guess. i guess and everything i mean like there probably will be a villain ne- near the end i think i think they hinted at medusa at one point so she'll be fighting a greek monster and everything oh uh, cool what was cool. it what, what was another thing i kind of liked about it uh yeah, I think that was everything. I, I I will tell more once I have read it, and maybe it does. Oh, no, wait, now I remember the thing I like. So Wonder Woman drops Steve off in Man's World, and, you know, she drops him off at the hospital, and she sees, you know, all the sickness and all the death and all the degradation and everything, and she's like, wow, this really does suck. My mother wasn't lying. <laughs> and she's like, and I hate it that Mom was right. <laughs> so she's like, screw this up, place. I'm going home. She basically becomes Cartman. Screw you guys. I'm going back to the Themyscira. <laughs> and, of course, the army tries to stop her and everything, and that's where I stopped reading. Okay. So, interesting setup so far. So, yeah, that was that was Wonder Woman Earth 1. That was one of the other things I read this week. Cool, cool. Uh, did you have anything else, or was that it for you? Um, oh, God, I've still got a couple of books. Um, uh, I, lightning round them, because I think I'm pretty much doing... I had uh, uh, Scarlet Witch number 5, I think it was. I'm about quarter way through this book and fucking hell this is a mind-bending issue yeah pe- people have been it's, loving him people have been saying that yeah they got a new artist on and his art is just it's so weird mm. it, it but like in the good way uh and the storyline is pretty cool as well she goes to spain and sort of helps a uh i think it's a catholic priest nice. um to do with like stuff with like burning witches and everything and never good don't burn it, witches like the it's just mind bending she goes on like this 
mind trip sort of thing that tells you like the history of what happened uh-huh. uh, to, for these witches and everything and it's like uh, you got to see this art like it's just fucking insane like Words i don't know what to compare do it to justice yeah it's just it's insane and then at the end it sort of changes art as well which is really cool uh but yeah that, that was a pretty cool issue i'm really enjoying that series james robinson's doing a really good job yeah uh what else uh, did i have oh i had hercules issue five mm. oh uh, yes, yes. Really cool book. I, i'm kind of really... banking those now people in the comment section weren't sure some people are saying it was canceled some people are saying it wasn't do we know because <laughs> we kind of mourned it <laughs> and thought it was canceled but we might have jumped the gun I think it, yeah, I think they're waiting until Civil War starts and then they're going to like quietly shove it off to the farm, maybe. <laughs> shove it off like old Yeller out to the woodshed. <laughs> Which is a shame because this series is really cool. Really cool. Um, yeah, this issue you just fought like the, those new gods and everything and one of them touched him. And because like they're, all, they're new gods, all their powers are modern. Mm-hmm. They have like um, advanced like missiles and everything and. He, when this god touches him, it apparently changes Hercules' mind and they'll be able to manipulate him now, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Issue 6, I think, came out this week, and I, I haven't read that one yet, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, what else did I have? I had uh, Earth 2 Society, issue 11. Oh, Earth yeah. Earth 2 yeah, is yeah. back at war. Back at war. Again. <laughs> Again. Well, it was a really cool way they did it because... Uh, Alan Scott, the Green Lantern, is trying to f- sort of get these two cities to sort of meet together and get them to stop doing the war. And in doing so, he starts a war because he lets slip that the planet is just a hollow husk. It's got no actual resources. Good job breaking it, hero. Yeah, well, he, he wanted to be honest with them and everything. Um, and in doing that, they're like, oh, well, in that case, we'll just have to take whatever we can from each other. And <laughs> But but the way the way they say it, they're like they're like friends at that point. They're like, oh, we're just gonna have to fight each other, oh. and it's like, oh, it's not your fault, you know. It's this Green Lantern dickhead's fault, you know. He told us this, and yeah, then they go off and just go start a war. So he's essentially brought in Road Warrior, is what it is. Where it's like, okay, time to take all the fuel and water we can now. <laughs> time to bring out the motorcycles and the leather chaps. <laughs> Pretty much, and it, it seems like they're also setting up like a uh, like a DC civil war with these characters as well, because uh, Alan it wants to help prov- like provide aid for all these people, relief and everything. Well, like Sandman, uh, Sergeant Steel, Sato, and all these other characters want to actually go to war mm. and fight, so they're like uh, at odds with each other. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Oh, and the Amazons they had. I don't know whether you'll probably know about it, but they, they had like this, it's like a Pandora's box type thing. Oh, like literally and, Pandora's box. No, I don't think it's literally Pandora's box. It's called Pandora's something. I can't remember what it's called, but it can store memories. And that's how they were able to get all the Amazons onto this new Earth too. They stored all their memories in here. And then oh. all the people of one of the generation ships were dying from radiation. So they took the souls and put them all in the humans so the humans became immortal and became half amazonian right so yeah there's this whole generation ship which is just amazons now and that's how they were able to survive and they plan to take over the world and use that box again well good going <laughs> <laughs> so yeah earth 2 is fucked again yeah, I, I mean, that's just kind of its lot in life, isn't it? It's just fuck nonsense. I know I know that was one of my big problems with it, and one of the reasons that I kind of stopped reading it, where I'm like, man, you guys, it's just always the end of the world for you guys, isn't it? And that just stops being entertaining at a point, for me at least. Yeah, like, for a while there, it looked like, oh, things are starting to, like, slow down. They're only going to be fighting, like, their villains and stuff in cities and everything. And they're like, nope, the, the planet is dying, there's a war happening. <laughs> they just can't get a break, and I'm like, I think that's earth 2's a lot in life just cataclysm and after cataclysm it's true and it's so funny because you go back and you read like the second volume of the james robbins run and it looked like it was calming down it's like okay this is the earth in the fallout of a war and everything that comes with it and this yeah. is like heroes trying to make it work in a world where there is no traditional superman no traditional wonder woman no traditional batman you know how, how will they figure it out and how will new heroes rise and then it's like oh converge oh well, i guess we're blowing it up then uh time for earth's end <laughs> And now in this book, okay, well, you know, well, it's 
calming down again and we're fighting villains and we're doing human stuff on a new world and everything and it's kind of reset but kind of not oh DC Rebirth coming out we might be bringing back the Justice Society well blow it all up again I guess <laughs> yeah send them back to normal earth <laughs> yeah I, I am amazed they didn't remember you and I kept saying that uh that we kept saying and we kept theorizing that okay so at the end of future's end at the end of convergence earth one and earth two will be fused and we'll have to deal with having a doctor fade and a hawk woman and everything yeah and then that's like never never like brought up like there's a doctor fate on earth one now but like they there's still a doctor fate in the earth two but he doesn't have the helmet he has a fragment of the helmet which he can still use but mm. yeah it doesn't like what what's going on yeah. Yeah, it, I don't know. Yeah, Earth, Earth 2, man. In a weird place, Earth 2 also, no solicitations for what they're doing for it in Rebirth. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we, we theorize that it'll probably just be the Justice Society of America, but we don't know. But what Justice Society will it be? Did you hear the theory that if you got, like, the special uh, preview booklet that you get at comic book stores, in the back, they have the Justice Society in, like, uh, in, like an hourglass? Oh, really? They do, and apparently that relates to an old Justice Society of America story where they got trapped right before Crisis. And if Convergence did rewrite the universe the way we think it is and the first Crisis didn't happen, does that mean the original JSA as we know them is still there in that hourglass somewhere? Ooh. Yeah, that would be That'd interesting. That would be interesting. It would be. That, that way there yeah. would be even more time immigrants, much like the Superman where it's like, yeah, I'm from an older continuity. Yeah, yeah, more old continuity characters coming in. Mm -hmm. um, last book I had was the Star Wars C-3PO special. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you liked that one. Yeah, it was a book that was meant to come out with the movie. But it didn't. And then it got pushed back to December, then it got pushed back to February, then it got pu pushed back to the end of March, then it came out last week. <laughs> well, how was it? I have before? no idea why it got pushed back either. Um, yeah, this was pretty cool. It was written by James Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, and it deals with the story of C-3PO and a gang of droids crash landing on a planet when they've just come back from a mission capturing a droid who has Admiral Akbar's location on it. And he's been captured by the First Order and has uh, been sent off to be executed. So they need to get his details back to the Resistance so they can go rescue him. And they crash on this awful planet where everything tries to kill them. And they're walking, and this droid sort of befriends C-3PO, this droid they captured, and he's talking about how he, he's always had his memories wiped, like protocol droids always get their memories wiped because they have a higher form of intelligence than, like, astromech droids and whatnot. Right. And he actually makes C-3PO remember all his old memories. Mm -hmm. Like, all, all the stuff, like, he remembers um, uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin's fight at Mustafa, he remembers oh. Naboo... Gen uh, Geonosis and everything, the Clone Wars. He remembers all of that. <laughs> um, thanks to the his... important stuff. Yeah, and all through all through the book, their droids are starting to get like picked off by like creatures from this Earth, from this planet, like flying bugs and sharks and all these different things. Until it's only C three PO and this one droid, and they take shelter under an X wing. I uh, don't know, an X wing a. TIE fighter because there's a homing beacon there they're going to use to call for help mm -hmm. it starts raining acid Oops. and this droid sacrifices himself to save C-3PO and C-3PO is only left with his red arm <laughs> again continually and, showing how uh, the droids in the Star Wars universe have feelings <laughs> and everything yeah yeah that's like brought up in this issue like he, he says like protocol droids have a bit more awareness of what they are and who they are than any other droids so like why are they treated with such disrespect like, like having them citizens. having their memory wiped like willy-nilly and everything and uh yeah c3 Perry, uh earlier on in the issue gets his arm chewed off by a, a shark so he replaces it with this arm of his dead friend Aww. when poe and bb8 come and pick him up oh yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool issue. I really liked it. It was, it was worth it, but I just don't understand the delays. Yeah. It's weird. I Too weird. That's kind of the theme of this show. We don't understand the delays. Yeah, I, I don't know, like, what was it delayed? Did they, like, change the story halfway through? Uh -huh. Or T2PO is going to team up with Jar Jar Binks and... <laughs> 
<laughs> He's going to get his arm ripped off in some slapstick manner and everything. <laughs> and they just shot that shit right down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that's it. That's pretty much it for this week. That's pretty much it for me, too. Uh, big, big, meaty week for the both of us there, and I think next week is going to be even bigger. You, you know, we haven't done... Uh, I'm pretty... pretty... Uh, short next week. I don't have that many comics. Arya, it seems like you and I always trade back and forth. You know, because we got a little extra time because this show isn't as long as it has been. Usually we do, we've done like an hour 30 for the last couple shows. Let's uh, yeah. l- l- let's take a look at the extended comic book forecast and what we can expect from the big two. Doesn't that yeah, sound fun? Yeah, yeah. I know we've got Action Comics 51. We do, so that'll be fun. Man, aren't you glad, Matt, that you can finally talk to me about Superman and I don't have to just be sitting here going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you understand it. I understand it. I'm in. I, I'm a late convert, but I am a convert. Thank you, Peter J. Tomasi. Uh, got Aquaman <laughs> number 51, which is actually shaping up to be quite a cool story. Cool. Uh, Harley's Little Black Book number three. She's going to be teaming up with Zatanna. Nice. Those are also big, long books. Those are extra length. Uh, Mar- Martian Manhunter, which, oh, yeah, geez, I guess that's still going on, isn't it? <laughs> Robin, son of Batman, that'll be done before we know it. Ooh, Superman American Alien, number six. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and Superman Lois and Clark, number seven. So lots of good Superman reading. I wonder if this Lois and Clark is the last issue. Ooh, I guess we'll have to figure that out. So I know it was only going to be like a seven or eight issue series. Titans Hunt number seven, which goddamn, this is the penultimate issue of this series. I swear to God, nothing's actually happened in it. <laughs> I, I had the feeling Dan Abnett when he knew he was just going to get to do the Titan series anyway. He's like, okay, guess what? This uh, this story's not going to have an ending. Then this one's just going to keep going and going. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, been enjoying it, but at the same time, it's like nothing's happened for the last three issues. Yeah, they're not even all together yet. Uh, on the Marvel side of things, we got Astonishing Ant-Man number seven. That continues to be a fun, interesting story. Captain America: Road to War number one, which is a special tie into Civil War. God, they've been doing a lot of those. I think it's. I think it'll just be like a. With these 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 prelude comics are so weird because whenever a new movie comes out, they re-release the previous prelude comics right. as as like a, a road to sort of thing. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. We also got Captain America, Sam Wilson. I think I think that's the penultimate standoff issue. I think so. I think this week we get that and I think New Avengers. Right. So, you know, be sure to check those out. We got uh, New Daredevil, New Deadpool, oh. New Extraordinary X-Men, which is more Apocalypse War stuff. Uh, he got Hyperion. We got Karnak. Karnak. <laughs> I know, I laughed when I read that too. I'm like, oh, that's so cute. Karnak, issue number three. <laughs> you got Obi-Wan and Anakin, which is also the penultimate issue. That's four or five. Yep. yep. Power Man and Iron Fist, number three. Silk, number seven. I don't know if that's a tie-in to that whole Spider-Woman event they've been doing so far. I've been sitting that one out just because I'm like, you know what? I have too many events. I have three going on right now. I can't take another <laughs> event. I'm already reviewing too many books. <laughs> totally Awesome Hulk, which I've actually dropped. Uh, Star Brand and Night Mask and Uncanny and Humans. Cool. So yeah, decent decent week all around. And I still I still have some more books that I need to get done and get out there just to meet deadlines. Yeah. So uh, with that, everyone, uh, we will bring the show to a conclusion uh, fairly early on my end. It's only 11.30 on my end. I'm not used to ending the show this early. And we started late, too. Yeah, but we still got like a, a decent decent show out of it. How the hell did that happen? I don't understand how things work. Stupid time, yeah, for, changing and everything. Yeah, time, you know, be, be, being a concept that we humans do to uh, <laughs> give meaning to the passage of the universe. <laughs> uh, so yeah, be sure to, as always, like, subscribe, favorite, check Matt out on Fortress of Solitude. Check out the Cape Jewel Facebook page. Actually, if you checked out the Cape Jewel Facebook page, uh, you would have seen I actually uploaded that Cape Kitchen early up there for fans to give notes. Maybe I'll do that more. Maybe I won't. Be sure to check out the Patreon. Be sure to check out all the other great videos we have on offer. And Matt and I will be back again next week. Same comic multiverse time, same comic multiverse place. Yeah, catch you later. Bye-bye.